Okay, welcome to week four of your workers' comp social security and bankruptcy class. Again, we are going to be focusing on bankruptcy and we're starting into the section of your book that's titled Part B, Consumer Bankruptcy. And um, I'm starting on chapter six, Introduction to Bankruptcy. So we have gone through all these different kinds of debts that you can get yourself into, either consensual or non-consensual, uh, secured, unsecured. We've gone through how creditors can collect on those debts and, um, and gone through a whole array of um, mostly legal ways that you, I mean, legal, of course, legal, but using the legal system, the judicial system to get your money. Creditors will be able to avail themselves of different means so that their monetary interests are protected. Okay. Now we're going to get into the bankruptcy process. If I'm a debtor, either a business or an individual or a farm, I may find myself in a position where I can't pay my debts. And we have always, as a society, provided for um, debtors to take a breather and protect the interests of creditors. It's important for you to understand that the bankruptcy code is written in such a way that we have grace towards debtors and we protect the interests of creditors. It's a balancing act. Um, it's a tough balancing act, but that is the purpose of the bankruptcy code to give creditors the opportunity to collect what they are owed and give debtors the opportunity to breathe. We do not want debtors after the bankruptcy process to be left destitute. Again, that doesn't serve public policy at all. What you're doing then is creating a class of citizens, either corporate citizens or individuals, who are then either dependent on government or social services, and we're not allowing them the ability to pull themselves up and succeed. We're, we're digging them a hole that it's almost impossible to get out of, okay? So understand that that's, that's the purpose of uh, why the code is written the way it's written. Um, this is, um, this goes back thousands and thousands of years. This concept of giving people and corporations a fresh start. Um, it, your book says a fundamental premise underlying modern American bankruptcy law is that in, circum in certain circumstances, debtors are entitled to some form of relief from their debts that will provide them with a fresh start. Okay, a fresh start. Now that can be, hey, we're wiping out all of your debts. That can be, we're wiping out debts that are crushing you and you can maintain payments on debts that you think you can move forward with. That can mean we're going to reorganize your world, either individual or corporation. And by the way, Fresh Start applies to businesses and farms also. Um, we're going to allow you to take a breather, put together a plan of reorganization so that you can move forward. The idea is not to bury people or businesses or farms. 
but to launch them so that they can be successful in the future. It doesn't serve anybody any good to tear people down. It doesn't serve anybody any good to have creditors lose out. Um, so again, this is a balance. But as we've learned in our previous lectures, creditors have an awful lot of options available to them to protect their interests. If I'm a creditor and I choose to give someone money, credit, and I don't secure it, with a security agreement, a financing statement, I don't file anything with the recorder's office, I'm taking a risk. Now, a lot of companies, a lot of that, um, that give credit out will bear the risk of that transaction by giving that person or company to whom they're giving credit a higher interest rate. Right, their point and their thought, their business model is, we'll recoup our money off the interest, and that balances out the risk of it being an unsecured debt. So creditors have options available to protect their interests. Debtors do too. Look, if you're a debtor, don't take out a loan. It's that simple, right? Um, or pay your bills, easier said than done, circumstances happen. And that's really why we have this bankruptcy code. Because there is an understanding in the law that things happen. People get sick, people lose their jobs. Um, and so you can plan and you can have a rainy day fund and that rainy day fund can go away like that. So this is why we are trying to, as a society, help people take a breath, pay the bills they wish to pay, give them a fresh start, help them reorganize how their business operates or their household operates, and then launch them so they're successful. So they never have to come back and do this again. Okay? This goes back, and your book goes through, you know, everything in our world is based on Judeo-Christian principles. Everything, every bit of your judicial system is based on Judeo-Christian principles. That's not a very popular thing to say these days, but it's true. Okay? And this is, um, you know, you can go back to 2400 BC where we had a code of conduct where you could wipe your slates clean. Um, in it's it, your book says in 1400, under Jewish law, every seven years, your debts are wiped out. By the way, under bankruptcy law, before it was reformed in the 1990s, um, you couldn't refile for bankruptcy within a seven year period. That's the reason why. Again, it's Judeo Christian principles. So, you know, you go all the way back to the beginning of our country, where um, in 1788, our Constitution provides that Congress shall establish uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States. This is so ingrained in just civilization, Western civilization as a whole, that constitutionally, Congress was mandated to do this. This is why bankruptcy law is federal law. We don't have a bankruptcy code for Ohio and a bankruptcy code for Pennsylvania and a bankruptcy code for Kentucky. We have a uniform set of laws that span the entire country that Congress passes. This is all federal legislation, okay? And the reason why Congress has the authority to do this is because the Constitution says they must. Okay? 
Um, so if you're interested, you know, your book goes through the history from 2400 BC all the way through today of changes that were made to bankruptcy laws um, to basically create the bankruptcy court system, which is a federal system, um, and then create the bankruptcy code, and then modify the bankruptcy code. Okay, so understand that this is um, something that's ingrained in our culture, and it is something that can be abused, but we take steps to balance the needs of the debtor and the interests of the creditors. Okay? Now, there are several chapters in the Bankruptcy Code. Bankruptcy Code is a whole series of, say, books. Look, in your mind, think of a bookshelf. Whole series of books divided up into chapters, okay? Chapter one of the bankruptcy code just has the general provisions. It generally has definitions, okay? Um, chapter three says how cases go through the system, the case administration. Chapter five talks about creditors, the debtor, and the estate. Now you're gonna hear me talk about the bankruptcy estate quite a bit. What does that mean? Estate is a word in law that we use in virtually every area of law. Estate means stuff. It's your stuff that you have in your bankruptcy. So if I'm filing for bankruptcy and I'm a business, my bankruptcy estate is everything that the business owns, literally everything, the inventory, the chairs in my office, the desk in my office, the paper, the copy paper, the copy ink for my printer, the printer, the computers, everything. My stuff. That's the bankruptcy estate. It also includes not just what I own, but what I owe. So the bankruptcy estate is the entire part, um, it is the entire picture of what it is you own and you owe. That is your bankruptcy estate. And chapter five talks about that. Okay, then we get into the different kinds of bankruptcy petitions, the different kinds of cases that you are permitted to bring. Chapter seven is probably the, the chapter of the bankruptcy code that everybody is most familiar with. And that is liquidation. And that's what most people think of when they think of fresh start. Fresh start really is not just where you liquidate everything and start over. Fresh start is really applies to every debtor that comes out of bankruptcy, whether or not you are liquidating everything and starting over again, or if you are keeping some things or you're reorganizing some things because you're basically taking a breath and doing a fresh start. But a lot of people will call the bankruptcies that are brought under chapter seven of the bankruptcy code your fresh start because you're basically liquidating all your debts. You're done and you start over again. Now, both businesses and individuals, and we call individuals under the bankruptcy code consumers. Both uh, individuals and businesses can file for relief under Chapter 7 of the Bankruptcy Code. Then there's Chapter 9. Believe it or not, municipalities, cities can file for bankruptcy. Okay, Detroit filed for bankruptcy. Okay, cities can owe more then they are able to pay. Typically it is that they owe more in city workers pensions um, than they are able to pay and they need to be able to reconfigure so that they can continue to be a viable 
municipal corporation. I don't want to get too much in the weeds here because we're really not going to go too much into chapter 9. We're really just going to cover chapter 7, 11, and 13. But under chapter 9, you have to understand that every city is actually a corporation. It's a special kind of corporation. It's a municipal corporation. And because technically it's a corporation, they are entitled to file for bankruptcy because corporations can file for bankruptcies. Now they're a special kind of corporation and that's why chapter nine is specifically devoted to it. But that is the, the rationale. So just, you know, when you're going through the city of Warren, understand you're going through a corporation. Just a different way of looking at the world. Okay. Chapter 11 is for businesses um, that, that are reorganizing. Almost every, um, e almost every business that runs flights in airports has filed for Chapter 11 relief where they say, whoa, we got too much debt, it's due too soon, we want to reorganize our business so that we can reconfigure our assets and our employment and pay our creditors a little bit less over a little bit longer period of time so that we can continue to operate our business. Okay? Um, chapter 12 is for family farms. Agriculture is such a huge part of our world and the family farm is has a special place in, in American culture and they also have specific um, you know, farm specific kind of debts and so there's a whole specific chapter of the code that's devoted just to them. Okay, um, Chapter 13 it's the chapter 11 for individuals, for consumers. So chapter 13 is used where I might own too much stuff to qualify for a chapter seven liquidation. And therefore what I'm going to do is kind of like the businesses under chapter 11, I'm going to reorganize my debt structure so that I don't lose everything that I own outright. And this way I can pay my creditors on a schedule, a little bit extended schedule, and then I come out again, launched with a fresh start. Okay. Um, chapter 15 um, is kind of your catch all chapter of the bankruptcy code that deals with if I've got a corporation that does business in Canada and uh, and the United States how do you handle that kind of a bankruptcy and and some other miscellaneous kind of cleanup is in chapter 15 okay so you know when we're talking about different kinds of bankruptcies um, I'd like you to use your Westlaw to go into your federal library statutes and just pull up the bankruptcy code just so you get a feel for how big, how massive this is. There are rules of procedure that are specific to the bankruptcy code. They have their own rules. It's its own court. Um, it is um, it is something that you need to recognize that if you're going to do bankruptcy work, you really kind of focus on it because it's its own specialized world. Okay? Now your book goes through a profile of consumers, individuals who file for bankruptcy. Um, it's interesting that most of the people who file for bankruptcy are in their mid-30s. 
think about it. People who have either gone to college um, or not gone to college, just got a lot of consumer debt or maybe have had an illness or lost a job, they've lived a life, okay? Um, and then your average person um, has a bunch of credit card debt um, and owes anywhere between ten and twenty thousand um, dollars in debt. Most people who file are going through some kind of a life change. Again, either an illness, a death of a spouse, a divorce, loss of a job. Those are your big reasons why people are filing for bankruptcy. And I'll say it again, in divorce law, most divorce lawyers either office with someone who does bankruptcy or they split their time between divorce law and bankruptcy. And by the way, a little bit of DUI stuff too because a lot of people going through divorce get a DUI. It just is. It's life. So understand that those life triggers are what lead people to bankruptcy court. More often than not. Are there people who go hog wild and don't care and are irresponsible? Of course. That's not the majority of people who go through bankruptcy court. Why do I tell you this? Well, because um, we need to have a little grace when it comes to this area of law. You know, when I did bankruptcy work, it astounded me that people would come in literally with grocery bags full of unopened mail because they were in such distress they couldn't even bring themselves to open their bills. They had no idea what they owed. And you would look and you would say, oh my gosh, these people really are overwhelmed. They're drowning. They can't breathe. Understand that these people will not behave the way you would expect people who are rational functioning members of society to behave. They're in distress. Um, now look, nobody goes to a lawyer because they love going to see a lawyer. Everybody's got a problem who goes to see a lawyer. Usually they're not happy. With divorces and with bankruptcy, they're in distress. They are drowning. And you need to keep that in mind. And, and I'm not exaggerating. People will come in with grocery bags filled with unopened mail from debt collectors, from courts, from bills, just their everyday bills, because they just can't. So when you think of the profile of who files for bankruptcy, keep in mind they're usually not people who are playing the system. Okay, I know a lot of people like to make that the case. It's not. Even with businesses, right? The majority of businesses in this country are mom and pop businesses. They're small businesses. Put yourself in the mindset of somebody who puts their heart and soul into a business and it's failing. And they can't pay the bills. And maybe they've used their home as collateral for a loan for their business. Think they're in distress? Heck yeah. Think their marriage is under pressure? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So be kind to people. That's my ultimate overarching message. Be kind to these people because they're going through quite a bit. Okay? Now, your book goes through all of the um, the, the laws, the, the, the rules of procedure that you need to know for bankruptcy court. Let's start off with the, rule, the, the federal rules of bankruptcy procedure. Okay, if These rules set out when you file, what you file, deadlines, you better know it. And if you don't know it, you better be familiar with where to look for it. Because with bankruptcy, just like with 
everything in the court system, there are deadlines. And if you don't protect your client's interest within those deadlines, if you blow a deadline, you've not practiced. So you have to know the rules of procedure. Something that you, if you do bankruptcy work, will have to be familiar with are the official bankruptcy forms. Okay? And for a chapter 7 and 13, there's a voluntary petition, there's schedules, there's a statement of financial affairs, there are proof of claims that creditors file, and notices. Okay, you want to make sure that you know where to find those forms because quite frankly you don't want to reinvent the wheel. Most, uh, most bankruptcy lawyers actually buy software that has all of this on it. And they will buy the same software that the court uses so everything is compatible. Okay, so it's a really big deal when the court gives a contract to a software company for the forms they're going to use because then everybody who does bankruptcy work is going to use those forms. And that's the same with probate, that's the same with domestic relations, any area of law where there are specific forms and rules, whatever the court uses, that's what you're going to use. Okay, there are the federal rules of civil procedure and the rules of evidence. Even though bankruptcy court is its own special entity, it is still a federal court, so you have to know those rules. And then, just to make it interesting, each bankruptcy court may have its own local rules. Um, some of them are just kind of silly, like this day of the week is when we have this kind of a hearing, and somebody wanted to be important, so they write it down as a local rule. Um, some of them are a little more important, like um, specifics that sl slightly vary from the federal rules on um, how many proof of claims or the time limitations for proof of claims. So you have to know those, okay? Um, where are bankruptcy courts? Well, bankruptcy, first of all, bankruptcy courts are established by Congress, and the President of the United States, after um, approval by the U.S. Senate appoints bankruptcy judges. They are federal judges, but it's a little bit different from uh, the federal court system. The federal court system, um, judges are appointed for life because we want to keep them out of the political fray. Bankruptcy judges are appointed for 10-year terms. Um, there are lots of reasons for them. I would not worry about those. Just understand they are 10-year terms. Most bankruptcy judges serve for life because there's no reason not to reappoint them. Okay? Um, now, there are core proceedings and non-core proceedings when it comes to bankruptcies. Um, if you look um, in your book at figure let's see, 6H, there is a whole list of the kinds of core proceedings that we have. Um, we're going to go into those in a bit more detail as we get into chapter 7 and chapter 11 and 13. Um, just understand that the core proceedings are um, things that will determine the direction of the case. That's the easiest way um, to handle it. Now, there are some administrative functions of the court, um, and what the judge will do is appoint a U.S. trustee to kind of manage the administration of the bankruptcy proceeding. Um, they are U.S. trustees are appointed by the bankruptcy judge. Um, they serve at the pleasure of the bankruptcy judge, and they act almost like a magistrate. What they do is they take the case in, they evaluate it, they see whether there are things that have to. Um, they they will handle some of the hearings, like the debtors' hearing. They they will. Uh, it's called a three forty one hearing. They'll handle that. They'll handle some of the non-core proceedings, even some of the core proceedings. But then they will also, 
if they are if there are assets that need to be sold they will manage the sale of assets and then the distribution of assets and especially in chapters 11 and 13 um, the trustee will manage payments to creditors over the lifetime of the plan and again we'll get into that in a bit more detail as we get into each particular section um, dealing with chapter 11 13 and 7 okay um, one thing you should know is bankruptcy court is paperless pretty much paperless everything is filed electronically and again this goes to your software program everything's got to be compatible with the court okay um, are there alternatives to bankruptcy relief yeah there are um, sometimes the bankruptcy trustee will say you need a receiver we're not going to go through bankruptcy we're going to have a receiver put in place to help you run your business so that you don't have to go through this process we think you can do this without having to go through um, a bulk sale transfer under the bulk sales transfer act we can transfer things okay sorry so um, some states have the bulk sale transfer act where businesses have to liquidate everything that's another alternative to bankruptcy um, a lot of these alternatives were put in place just because we wanted to hold businesses responsible for paying creditors and again I want you to keep in mind the bankruptcy code is a balancing act everything that we do through the bankruptcy code including the role of the US trustee is designed to protect creditors it is to give debtors relief but it is designed to maximize um, the money that creditors get we have public policy that we don't want people not to loan money because they're too afraid of bankruptcy we want we don't want people to um, you know make it so difficult to get credit that the that the entire economy freezes up um, and so we want to make sure that creditors are given the benefit of whatever um, bargain they made with debtors especially those with secured debts if you're an unsecured creditor you're kind of left hanging in the wind most of the time because you didn't protect your own interests when you entered into this agreement or you decided you were going to have a higher interest rate and that was going to be the balance of your risk in giving an unsecured debt so understand that you know this system is set up to have grace for people who are in distress debtors and protect the interests of creditors because both of those goals are central to a functioning society with a good strong economy and it's a delicate balancing act US trustees primary responsibility is to protect creditors it is not to protect debtors or make sure debtors walk away with as much as they possibly can it is to protect creditors and so keep that in mind we want creditors to be able to continue to loan money and they can't do that if everybody's reneging on their agreements with the creditors then they're out of business and then the economy falters so I want you to just keep that in mind I also want you to keep in mind as we go into these chapters this is not a moral you know I'm telling you that this is based on Judeo-Christian principles um, we are not going to look poorly upon creditors we're not going to look at them as as vultures we're not going to look at them as bad guys because they serve a really important function in society just like vultures do no they're not vultures I'm just kidding but you know they they provide 
a lot of people with the ability to open a business or to buy a home. How many people would be able to save up enough money without having a mortgage to buy a home or a, or a vehicle or a boat? And then what happens to the construction industry if people can't get credit to buy homes or people can't get credit to open businesses and hire people um, or what happens to the boat industry if people can't borrow money to buy boats what happens to the recreation industry or to you know everybody who thrives on um, a boating community how many jobs are created it's a ripple effect that's my point so if credit dries up because creditors are afraid that so many people are going to renege on their um, on their contractual obligations with them they're going to tighten up and not loan money very easily which then has a ripple effect in the economy bankruptcy is there to protect the interests of creditors so that doesn't happen okay keep that in mind okay that's the end of this chapter there are assignments and a discussion in a discussion assignment make sure you get that accomplished and um, if you have any questions please contact me email me text me call call the administration's office and tell them to have me call you please I want you to succeed so please ask me any questions that you need answered okay Thanks very much.